What's going on everyone? It is your boy, Mezzy T, aka Stuart Tough. In today's video, I sit down with John Lamerton and we have a chat about some really, really interesting subjects and it's fascinating to be able to pry into the mind of someone who's kind of doing what you want to do, if that makes sense. In the intro, as you'll see, when I introduce John, I don't do a very good job. I just call him an author, but he's much more than that. He's an author, he's obviously a father, um, but he's a business owner and he's an entrepreneur and he's doing very well for himself and he's got a fantastic communication style and I think you'll agree when you watch the watch the, the podcast yourself, you'll think, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. It's really accessible information. I tried to ask questions that I thought you guys would like to hear answered and also obviously what I wanted to hear answered and I'm coming at it from my perspective. My favourite part of the interview is where John sits, sits down with me and he just says like, this is what you do to get started, do it. A few timestamps are going to be down below uh, and they're just pointing out my favourite parts of, of the video. Um, but yes, without further ado, please sit back, enjoy, and uh, yeah, take in some knowledge from me and Mr. John Lamerton. In today's video, we're going to be chatting with Mr. John Lamerton, who is an author. Can you introduce yourself, please, John? Cool, yes. Yeah. So John Lamerton, uh, former civil servant, um, self-taught business owner. Um, 20 odd years ago, I decided I hated my job so much that I would teach myself internet marketing. Um, three problems with that. Not one, I'd never run a business before. Uh, number two, I knew nothing about marketing. And number three, I didn't even own a computer, let alone have access to the internet. So I did what any uh, self-respecting kind of 22 year old with not a clue would do. And that is I went to my local WH Smiths and picked up a copy of Internet Marketing for Dummies. Um, if ever there was a book that was written for me, it was that book. Uh, so I read that book, I followed the instructions, and I worked really, really, really bloody hard for about 18 months. And it took me nine months to earn my first check. That was for £13.51. and pence. Nine months later, I quit the day job. And I've just been learning ever since. So that process of don't know what I'm doing, pick up a book, learn how to do it, follow the instructions, keep what works, throw away what doesn't, add a little bit of me into it. And I've just compounded that now over 20 years. So 20 odd years later, uh, yeah, I've been involved in 60 small businesses, written three books, got a podcast, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, I am a student of what works. And I will always forever be a student. I love that. I love that. I mean, one of my favorite things there is that it used the, is it one of the books with the yellow cover? It's like internet marketing for dummies, that kind yeah, of thing. That's it. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I think you owe a lot to that book. I want to know, was it any good? It, it was all right because, and I said, follow the instructions. It was laid out very much like an instruction manual. So I was able to look at page 15 mm. and go, right, okay, I need to, I don't know, set up a website. Right, okay, I need to go to this website. I need to type this in. Hang on, I need, I need both hands now. I've got the book open in one hand and my typing finger in the other hand. Oh, yes. People <laughs> don't was, lose that habit. It was step by step. And obviously, you know, if, if you were to pick up that book now, you'd be like, what are you, what is this book talking about? You know, where, bear in mind, I learned on 56K dial-up. <laughs> Distant past that is, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah, thankfully. What I find, what I find fascinating about this, and I've thought about this a lot, actually, and it, I think it's um, mostly due to your book. It was, it is that quote of the follow the instructions, and I know you saw my video review on your book, and I said there that, it's so impactful for me. Um, mm. I think we're in, we're in an age of information, aren't we? It's all my, well, I feel like it's overwhelming. And I think a lot of my demographic, the people I talk with, my friends, they'll be in this situation where they're like, oh, he's the, like, for example, we take the gym. You can do 20 million different ways of going to the gym. Yeah. And then you get stuck in trying to find the right one instead of just picking something and going. Absolutely. And then following your path, um, as I said, I mean, gyms are 
perfect example because you could pick up any one of 20,000 different books, different strategies. And ultimately, you do need to follow the instructions of one book, one strategy, and then decide for yourself what in this book really hits home with me and what makes me go, eh, not so much. Mm -hmm. Throw that away. Then pick up the next book, and this is the crucial bit, attach the next book to the first book. Don't throw the first book away and say, okay, I've finished with that strategy now. I'm going to pick up the next one. Attach what you liked from the first one to what you know from the second one. There's always crossover with books as well. I think most kind of health and fitness books will agree that getting exercise is a good idea, eating real food is a good idea. Most of them have that basic principles and that's what I'm looking for first and foremost is what are the building blocks? What are the principles that most people would agree on? Everything beyond that is noise. Yeah. And open to interpretation. It's interesting, isn't it? Like I think there's a thing in self-help and stuff like that. I know you you are an avid reader as well. You put, we noticed that there's many like psychological studies that are the foundations. Mm. And I do like to think about I've been explaining this to a few people recently. We have like what I like to call it Lego blocks in our mind, we get this foundational Lego block. And with that, we can start adding the next piece on the next yeah. piece on the next piece on. I, this was last year, I was listening to Tony Robbins, I've got kind of the book on my shelf there, but I was listening to the audiobook. I've never heard the audiobook. I think it was Awaken the Giant Within. No, it was Unleash the Power Within. That was mm. it. Um, so I've never heard Tony Robbins speak this. Obviously, Tony Robbins is a very, very good speaker. And I remember where I was when I heard this line because it stopped me in my tracks. I'm out walking the dog, listening to this book. And Tony Robbins just explains, just with a throwaway comment, how we learn anything. He said, all we do is we take something we don't know and we attach it like a Lego block to something we do know. Mm. I'm, I just went... <laughs> oh my god it's so obvious that's what i've been doing all these years i you know when i even with internet marketing for dummies i didn't know most of that stuff but i operated a computer in my day job so i was able to take the how to build a website how to market a website the stuff i don't know and attach it to the i can turn on a computer i can type i understand how a mouse works i understand where things are on a screen very, very basic, but yeah, that, that simple principle of what do you, you cannot take something you don't know and attach it to something else you don't know mm. and expect to remember it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It just kind of gets lost in the air, doesn't it? It's like, yes, that's yep. brilliant. It floats around and all of a sudden it floats off and you're like, well, that was a bit of a, a bit of a waste. Exactly. And I, you know what, like listening obviously to your book, I feel like we know each other quite well, actually. It's a weird... <laughs> despondence isn't it between like your your experience and you and then people listening to your book they feel like they know you they're invested I definitely feel that way um but with your book it's so interesting because I think and I could be wrong please do correct me but I think that's how you try and explain the principles in your book you you explain it like to me like one of my mates or an Englishman, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, okay. Like, you know, you look at the TV and then you've got an example there. You're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It's um, what I mean, you know, from reading my books that my business hero is Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett's superpower is not really investing. It's distilling things so that they're really, really simple. It's explaining things that in a way that anybody can understand. It takes something very, very complex and simplify it. So I'm not saying I'm anywhere near on his level, but that is always my aim is whatever I learn, I want to simplify it as much as possible. And that comes to attaching it to my Lego blocks of, if I'm going to remember this, how am I going to remember it? I need to liken it to Game of Thrones, Mr. Bull from Peppa Pig. <laughs> I need these yeah. analogies because that's how I think of it. That's how I remember them. Um, and you said kind of, you know, explaining it like bloke down the pub. That's a, I get a lot of, um, kind of reviews and comments for people saying down to earth, plain English, everything like that. My, um, <laughs> there was one guy sent me a message. He went, John, don't take this the wrong way. He said, <laughs> but the reason I love your books and don't, again, don't take this the wrong way, but you're nothing special. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah, 
that, that's exactly what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for, I am the, the bloke down the pub. I'm, I'm the guy who, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize me in the street. It's yeah. just, I am a normal bloke who just literally picked up books, read the books, followed the instructions and hasn't stopped doing that for 22 and a half years now. You got that, like, it, uh, did you get like the positive feedback loop from it? So you got a little bit of motion and all of a sudden you're like, right, oh, I'm getting more motion, more yeah. motion. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, so I, yeah, um, yeah, internet marketing for dummies. Then I think I went on to rich dad, poor dad. Then it was the millionaire next door. Then it was a slight edge. And I'm just literally stacking up all these books. Now I did get to the point um, a couple of years in where I thought I knew everything. Mm. Cool. Yeah, got all that. You know, I'm making a really, really good living here now. Um, I'm reading, I'd pick up a book and the book would be talking to people who were at the start of their journeys or they weren't making any money or, you know, this is, a lot of the American titles were, this is why your life sucks. They mm. can just tell us the subtitle. Yeah. And I just thought, well, this it's beneath me. It's, you know, I'm, I'm better than this. So I gave up on reading for, I don't know, six or seven years. And it wasn't until literally I got myself a mentor um, when kind of my business was starting to fail. <laughs> um, and my business mentor said, well, you know, what, was, what was the last book you read? And I went, well, it was about seven years ago. It was this one. It was rubbish. He went, oh, read this one. And I read this book. I can't remember what the book was now. I was like, oh, that's amazing. He said, well, read this one. Oh, I love that book. And now I, I shared my Audible library with someone the other day and went, you've got 279 books in your library. I was like, yeah, I haven't actually got time to listen to them all yet. But yeah, that is, that's where I'm at with it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, that's just fascinating, isn't it? Because I think I've been through that process. I'm like, do I really need to read this this part or whatever? And then you're going to miss, like, the Tony Robbins example. You miss that nugget of information. Yeah. That could, that's worth 10, 20, 30 books, you know? Um, one thing I wanted to ask then, because obviously you've been through this process and for someone like me um, or younger, not my demographic, young male or young female, in fact, from what you've taken in, obviously this is not just your books and stuff, but this is your life experience and stuff like that. Is there any like fundamentals that you would focus on? Like, I don't want to use the word shortcuts, but I'm going to use the word shortcuts, you know? <laughs> oh, is there, are there a shortcut? Um, there are. But they are more complicated than a simple shortcut. So the shortcut, I think, that ends all shortcuts is probably the 80-20 principle, the Pareto principle. The idea that all things are not created equal. That there is a small portion of your time, your energy, your focus, the work you do that generates a disproportionately larger return on investment and vice versa. There's activities you do that you put a lot of work and a lot of effort into that give very little returns. And again, you can, you can apply that to going to the gym. You can apply that to dating. You can apply that to healthy eating. You can apply it to building a business, investing, anything like that. But figuring that out takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of not actually doing any work, but planning your work. Mm. Um, I listened to the uh, Ray Kroc autobiography, uh, the founder of McDonald's. Um, that was last year as well. And he had this line in there, I plan my work and then I work my plan. So at its simplest, that is the secret to any success. Plan your work and then work your plan. When you drill down to that, plan your work, that means looking at all the opportunities you have in the entire universe versus the very tiny amount of time you have available to you and money and energy and headspace and saying, what is gonna give me the biggest bang for my buck? And no to everything else. That's what plan your working is. <laughs> so that so simple little process there and then all you've got to do is work the plan. And all that means is continuing to say no to everything else. Anything that isn't highly leveraged, we say no to. 
in that yeah that is fascinating it's become it kind of it's like a laser focus prospect isn't it mm. I, I mean, I, I messaged him like directly, didn't? And you, 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 you uh, messaged me back, and I, I'm struggling with this, and I think many people will. Where yeah. I'm overwhelmed, and your simple advice was just to use your word. It's like you've got to say no to more things. Yeah. And at the time, to- at the time, and I am still guilty of this because I am one of those people who wants to do it all, and then nothing happens, and I get burnout and th- that whole process. But I've stopped going to jujitsu. But I've yeah. not let my health go down. But that yeah. jujitsu time was six, well, seven till eight o'clock. And I've got to right. be in bed for nine. And then taking notes of that, that's allowed me to focus on this new idea that I've got in my head. Yeah. And just allocate a little bit of time to that, as you say, to invest in those, the 2080, uh, is it Pareto's or Paletto? Uh, Pareto. Pareto. Yeah. My, pa- that's Pablo a tip Pareto, one, isn't it? I believe, was the guy who discovered it. Yes, yes, yeah. And it, it's, it's it's that classic trope i think is where it's like just because you work hard it doesn't mean yeah you're going to earn loads of money or you're going to be majorly yeah. successful whatever that means to you it's yeah. work smart isn't it look around you there are plenty of people who are working hard and getting nowhere and then there are a select few who don't seem to be working very hard but seem to be getting whatever they want so rather than being jealous and saying, oh, that's, that's, you know, they don't deserve it. Yes. And I'm not getting what I deserve. You, no one gets what they deserve. You get what happens to you and what you make of it. You, you know, life will deal you the hand of cards you're dealt with. You've, it's up to you to max out. It's already up to you to make the most of the hand you're dealt. So stop blaming others and look instead and saying, why? Why is that guy... Succeed. Why is the five for eight basketball player mm. made a career out of that? Because he should not be able to. Hundred <laughs> percent. And um, there's a book that I, I don't ask me. It's a weird thought process, but I thought that I was thinking of you when I, when I'm listening to it. Yeah. Again, it seems weird to say to another man out loud, but here we are. <laughs> um, and it's hyper. It's a book book with a cliche title, and it did put me off. It's High Performance by Jake Humphrey and Professor Damien Hughes. Jake okay, Humphrey yeah. is the guy who presents BT Sport. Yeah, another guy. Yeah. Um, they've got so many fascinating um, principles in the book, and it's a brilliant listen. That's what I'm doing. But uh, it, they really hammer home responsibility, and it's mm-hmm. this stoic principle of. You know, like sometimes in life you get dealt a shit hand. Like that's just a fact. It, you can't control that, but what you can control is how you react to that. Yeah. And that when Absolutely. you, it literally gives me goosebumps to think about it because you're taking control back in your life, aren't you? Yeah, it is because it's it's Tony Robbins 101. Is if life happens to you, you have no control. You just well sit back and just wait for the lottery and see what happens. When life happens for you, you realise that you have an element of control. Yet there is no, you know, there is no, there is an element of chance. If you are crossing the street tonight, you could be sideswiped. You know, you you a plane could crash on on your house. You don't know what's going to happen, but you do have more control than you think. If you know something terrible happens to you, hope really hope it doesn't. But if it does, you have the choice on how to respond to that. Um, one of my one of my friends um, did a podcast with him. He um, was in Afghanistan, lost both his legs and an arm. Um, he now has has an amazing life. He's raised nearly a million pounds for charity last year, um, and he was determined not to wallow, not to just have a pity party and say "woe is me," because he understood. And again, he'd done a lot of the Tony Robbins training. He understood that what happens to him doesn't matter anywhere near as much as how he reacts to what happened to him it's yeah it, it's it's really empowering and you hear stories like that and I, I think it makes you feel like inspired not only that but also grateful because you know if someone else can if someone else can do it you can do it too yeah and we I think we learn this helplessness don't we it's like oh shove yourself into like a system whatever that would be school college job and then you're like, right, this is it. This is how stru- this is how life has been yeah. taught to you. Deal with that, and that's your life. Like, and then it, I think it takes a certain type of person to step out of that box. I, you may agree or disagree. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, 
I, I think so. And I think, um, interesting, I've got a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. So they're kind of just going into secondary school. Mm. And I was amazed when Jack, my oldest, went into secondary school. And before he started, they sent home a book. Okay. He went, by the way, he's going to the same school that I went to a few years ago. <laughs> just, just, just a cut. Just, 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 just a couple. It's aged a little bit. <laughs> so I remember what school was like for me. And school for me, you know, in the, in the last century um, was a little bit of a hangover from the Industrial Revolution where we all sat in rows and we copied stuff off the blackboard and we were all led into our careers. By the way, I was told I couldn't go into a career in marketing. Love that. That involved moving Love to it. London. We don't do marketing in Plymouth, apparently. <laughs> anyway, they, they sent this book home and it was Matthew Syed's book. No I way. Like, so my kid is learning about growth mindsets and neuroplasticity and I'm like, this is all that's amazing. welcome to my world yeah for sure <laughs> so yes yeah, it's, it's interesting they are doing and one of his um subjects was pd personal development Brilliant. no way this is fantastic. no way but actually they are working on developing the kids the humans as well as still churning out autonomons that were that are going to work in factories <laughs> Yeah, that that's the thing. I, you know what? I, I would not have expected that because I think I've seen like a, a conspiracy side of things, but it's kind of to what you were saying, like there's an industrial side to school, isn't it? It's preparing you for I don't want to say this in like a in like a mean way, but it's like a an autonomous life. You 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 have to work and they want to get the most out of you. And that's more of what the Industrial Revolution was, wasn't it? It was about your muscles, your manpower. What yeah. can you shift around? How much coal yeah. can you move? But in these days, they say that, obviously, we're, we're, we're information workers, aren't we? And it's a yeah. totally different ball game. Yeah. But even so, where, you know, I say Jack's 10, uh, 12 now. So he's really going to be in the working world a decade from now. Mm. So actually, he's not probably going to be an information worker because there's going to be AI bots that are just going to do the information jobs. So Jack needs to go into the creative arts, where, mm. which is where the AI can. not So school needs to try and guess where the work, working world is going to be a decade in advance or two decades in advance, because there's no good training someone that's going to do a job that's going to be obsolete after yeah, five definitely. years. You know, well, well done, you got your, you got your qualifications. Unfortunately, they're useless. <laughs> A lot of people have found that, haven't they, during their time? Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, in we was you were talking earlier about um, this principle of uh, hard work. And now, mm. I'd find it interesting because I know you have a busy schedule. Would you say that you work hard? Uh, yes, I do. But I would say that I choose to work hard. Okay. What? So I, what? Go on. I think there's a big, big difference because I never used to. I used to just just work hard i was a hustler i was just i'd land at my desk i would work 100 hour weeks until i dropped and then i would go back and do it again the next week um now i work hard when i want to so that i don't have to work hard ever if i feel like tomorrow morning i wake up and i feel that i really don't want to work i could blow tomorrow off if I decide that there's an opportunity that comes up next week that I cannot say no to, that it's just amazing, and I've got the opportunity to fly out somewhere, and you know, I don't know. Let's say, let's say, Richard Branson or Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett gives me a ring and says, "John, are you free for lunch next Wednesday?" Yes, Warren, I am. I I don't even need to look at my diary. Yes, I am because I want to just drop everything. So, in terms of busy. Yes, I'm busy. Yes, I work hard. But I work hard so that I have, and I work hard on the type of things that I do my 80-20 analysis, that if I take my foot off the gas, my business does not stop. It will slow, but it will slow very, very gradually. My business has momentum, and I do a lot of work on the evergreen assets so that they've got long residual benefits. So the work I've done today, for example, I've worked very hard today and, and I've been writing emails today, permanent emails, not one-off emails to friends and to colleagues and to clients, but emails that are gonna sit in a nurture sequence for my team 
for my clients and for my prospects. I've looked at three different lists. I've written probably 20 emails. Those emails will go out to people as and when forever. Those, you know, there are people, there are people now who receive emails and say, I liked your email today, John. I'm like, cool. <laughs> Which one was that then? Cause I probably wrote it about four years ago. Um, I've written a blog post today or continued writing a blog post. Uh, once that blog post is complete and it's optimized for SEO and I've put all my links to it, I will not need to touch that blog post again. And that blog post will be a permanent lead source to sell my books, to fuel my business. We're recording this now. Hopefully this is going to raise awareness of some of my books. I'll sell more books. Great. If I work hard doing this sort of stuff, I can take tomorrow off or I can take next week off or I can take the summer off or my dream is, you know, I want to winter abroad. So mm. I'll work during the summer and I will winter abroad. If the kind of work I'm doing is posting on social media every single day, five times a day on social media and I'm speaking to clients live and I'm just code calling clients. If I don't work tomorrow, I don't earn, I don't earn, tomorrow, mm. I don't earn any money. My machine stops the minute I stop. So I've built a machine, an ecosystem that has momentum. And I work very, very hard building that machine and maintaining that momentum so that I don't need to work hard. It, it's fascinating. I think, uh, I think your, your work is freedom, isn't it? That, that's, that's the end goal that you're saying there to, to summarize what you've said. And that's such a powerful thing in this day and age. It's interesting. Now I've read your evergreen assets. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say I'm not your usual reader because I, I don't have a business. It's a business book for someone who I would say wants to improve their business. I think yeah. that that gives me a unique perspective, however, and a unique start because when you jump in to, you know, you start off with the right way of doing things. I can follow that. Like you said, with your book and you, we could, we could look at page 97 and be like, right. I could, yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll actually go for the email list. Now, now I've got something going with the rest of it. Yeah. For, I want to get into a few specifics of evergreen assets because mm -hmm. behind there, this might make that might, you might like that, but that is my little mind map of like the kind of the key takeaways that I had from it. But for someone like me and someone that's kind of wants to step into the entrepreneurial world and, you know, maybe not fully commit um, to like sacrificing their like stable income, um, but they want to transition or I, I can't remember the word you used specifically pivot. Was it? I don't know. I, see, I'm, I'm moving away from pivot because to me, a pivot has become um, kind of synonymous in the world. now as just a mess up. Whoops, yeah. we've messed up. So we're pivoting. It's an about turn. Um, for me, it's an evolution. It's, it's gradually changing. Maybe a slight I don't know, slightly like a, like a like shift, revolution. <laughs> like a shift ta taking one degree. And if it, that one it's degree like takes correction, that's, there that's we go. Yes, one. I like yeah, this. I love that. <laughs> so, for someone like me, then obviously yeah. I've read Evergreen Assets, but people haven't. And mm -hmm. we're going to implore that they do because there's a lot of good knowledge to, to learn from that. What would, where would you start? What would your starting thing be? Say, you've obviously got to get an idea. Yeah. So yeah, you've exactly. got a decent idea. Where, where we would we go from there? Yeah. So I, I did a talk last week for some college kids. So these are kind of 15, 16 year olds. And they were asking kind of exactly that. Where do I start? What's the first thing I should do? And the thing I said there was, okay, so Evergreen Assets, we, we talk, and if you can see that on the screen there. Yep. Um, for those listening on Audible, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, the Evergreen Assets is six asset classes and it is an ecosystem okay so you bring leads into your system you nurture those leads you convert leads into sales you then fulfill the sales you do all the admin to tidy everything up and then hopefully we get things uh, going going viral and not not in a social media sense but going viral in that you replicate your customers so that's the ecosystem we want to replicate whether we have a thousand customers or whether we are getting our first customer. So 
where to start with any business. If you're starting a brand new business and you've got an idea in your head, one customer. All businesses exist to solve problems. So solve a problem for one customer, right? That your lead is not anybody, okay? It's not, oh, I'll ask me mum, I'll ask me mate if he'll buy my product. No, prospects. So who can I help with this product? Not who's got 20 quid and could buy it off me. Number two, we're gonna nurture that lead. Now, it's easier if you've got one customer to nurture that lead because that person is the only one you're gonna speak to just as the cat <laughs> walk across the screen. There we go, where is she going? <laughs> Number three, we are gonna then ask for the sale. We're gonna convert that into a sale. And again, the evergreen assets there is an offer that converts. It's convincing prospects that I can solve your problem and I will solve your problem. And I am the perfect person to do this. I know exactly what you want. I'm the perfect person to get it for you. And for just three payments of 79 pounds or for just 25,000 pounds, whatever the price tag is, they go, yeah, absolutely. Shut up and take my money. Just solve my problem. We're then going to fulfill that sale. We are going to, we're going to give them what they promised. Okay. If we said, I can fix your problem. I can solve your problem. I can, I can do that for you. This is where we make sure we can do it. We then, the admin stuff is very easy with one customer. You know, <laughs> there's, there's one invoice, there's one bit of accounting to do, but we tidy it all up. And then we ask them, cool, did I solve your problem? Are you completely happy? Cool. Who else do you know who's got that problem? Perfect. So we then, hopefully that person comes up with another customer. We then replicate that. That customer then goes back through the same ecosystem. Every time we put a customer through this ecosystem, something will break, something will go wrong. Um, your nurture sequence will suddenly send them an email that's out of date or your offer will expire or your website will break. Something will go wrong and there'll be an opportunity to fix that ecosystem. And as you turn from one customer to two and two to four and four to 10 and 10 to, to 2,500, eventually you'll get more process in place. You'll get more systems in place. You'll get more bloated. You'll get more stuff. You'll get more little cogs in your machine. And then eventually you'll need to sweep through it like Gordon Ramsay coming in on Kitchen Nightmares and you'll say, why have we got this mammoth menu here with all the Tex-Mex, Chinese, Indian, bloody frozen microwave meals? And you say, well, somebody asked for it once and so we did it and then we needed to keep it on hand. So we then simplify. But ultimately where to start is just that. Solve a problem for one person and just work through that's the simple six steps, nothing else. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, if you're an existing business owner and you're optimizing your machine, great. Towards the back of the book, I talk about how I started two of my businesses. So, for example, my sports betting business was a one-page website, which we didn't even fulfill the sales. So we were just running affiliate links on that. We were putting it over, so we didn't do a, fil a fulfillment. Um, we had one traffic source, which was Google. So leads came from Google. There was very little nurture. It was just go here and sign up for something else. That went straight to sales. Fulfillment went to someone else. Admin, very little because we worked with about five companies. And then viral, we just encouraged people to share it. So very simple setup. My coaching business. Um, I had a network of people, that's relationships, that's an asset I already had. I attached it to another cog I had, which was my kitchen table. And I just made an offer, so sales asset. I made an offer to six people and said, come around my kitchen table, I will help you. I will solve your problems. I will help you to improve your businesses. Those six people did. I fulfilled it, I delivered on my promises, and then I went back to those six. I said, right, from next year it's becoming paid. And who else do you know? I made it viral. So six became eight, eight became 10, 10 became I think 13. And then I ran out of chairs around the kitchen table and we ended up having to move to a pub and then online. But the business or both businesses where they are now 
I describe those in quite a lot of detail and I walk you through. I've got this asset, this, and I just mm. list over several pages all the assets that are in play. But then I take you back in time and say, but it started off with this asset plugged into this asset with a bit of duct tape. That's how we started. Start simple. Don't overcomplicate it with, uh, and again, it's very easy. You read any, you know, any personal development book, you start watching YouTube videos and TED Talks to get the whiteboard out and start planning your funnels. And yeah. there's a story I told in here about my Mrs. Doyle funnel, which was uh, when I, I'd started overcomplicating things and I created this if then, you know, if this, then that funnel. Uh, do you want to buy my product? No. Okay, well, how about this product? N no. Okay, why don't you want to buy that product? Well, because I didn't. Well, how about if I offered you this product instead? And it was just all automated until people just told me to go F myself. <laughs> it's, I think that, do you know what, picking up on that, it's so, that's a brilliant process for something that works like a computer, isn't it? It's like, yeah. it's so logical. That it's like, we know based on this condition, this is going to happen. Yeah. But if you could, if you could do that for people, you'd be, you'd be like a billion, billion, billionaire because yeah. we are, everyone's different emotions, all this stuff. And then, it's so interesting because I am one of those people. I'm an avid planner. I'm a logical yeah. thinker. And I think I can just plan my way through this. But sometimes <laughs> you've just got to, you have just got to go back to simplistics. And I don't think I've ever heard that before. I've heard of problem solving because yeah. that makes sense, obviously, providing value. Good. But just to focus on that problem for one person yeah. and then rep and then put them through. Now there's a a framework there you can visualize it going through yeah. can't you and it, when you've explained that to me that's really made like a uh, the flitch the the switch flick a little bit there yeah. because i mean a lot of people in startups will have heard of minimum viable product that's essentially what it is but it could be that for a service business it could be that for an e-commerce product it could be that for anything it's just ultimately you've got a <laughs> I was going to say, you've got a great idea. You've got an idea. You don't know if it's a great mm, idea. Yeah, that's important, you isn't go it? go to the market and the market will tell you if it's a good idea or not. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you know what? I, I, it's going gonna to be funny because I watched one of your podcasts. Um, it was just a YouTube thing. I, I cannot, I think it was, uh, it's an entrepreneurial podcast. You might have guessed, but um, the guy made comparisons and gestures with Gary V. Now, I don't watch Gary V a lot these days. <laughs> And I know that you're against that uh, the hustle culture. Um, yeah. And I think it, there's two things here. One, you can get lost in just watching the videos, watching what he does and like, yeah, yeah that's me working really hard. But two, although you have totally different approaches to it, a lot of the fundamentals that you're saying, like they are true from both of you. You're kind of saying, you're reading from the yeah. same hymn sheet. However, you just saying it in different accents kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, it's very similar to, let's say, the, the, the church analogy is actually you can have different preachers, you can have different faiths. Ultimately, most faiths, most religions do have the same building blocks. They do have, you know, they, they may have, let's say, different interpretations on it and different slants. But ultimately, there are principles that you can't really argue with um, beyond um, Gary V's you know opinions on it and <laughs> sleeping less i, I th actually I, I do think gary v is coming coming around to my way of thinking since i first started writing about him kind of five years ago six years ago he started coming out with a little bit more work life balancey yes kind of yeah like, oh, I, I didn't quite mean this <laughs> he, he he's so one way isn't he and i think that yeah. he's a brilliant marketer because people yeah. fall in love and they romanticize yeah. his way of thinking because he's, he's so open what i find interesting too is that you both give like a lot of information away for free yeah. and like i i think that's the sign of someone who's like you can you can you can trust do you know what i mean because there's there is, like you've got your book don't get me wrong like that that's fine yeah but ultimately to me you just you are trying to help people there's not really a yeah. motive after that if, if someone wants to know more drop you a message yeah you exactly. know I, I think again that's a that's a little bit of mindset there because i've met people who have got some ideas but I'm not going to give them away for free. You know, you're going to pay me for that. Okay, so why should I pay you? They're good ideas. 
how do I know they're good ideas? I'm telling you, you're the guy selling them to me. And this is a big part of the sales process of Evergreen Assets is, well, how do I take away the risk from the client that I'm going to make a bad mistake? Well, one of the greatest ways is by giving them lots of nurture, got lots of love, lots of um, information up front. Um, I have never, I, I do give away a lot of information. I say uh, today I'm writing those emails I mentioned, most of those are for free. There's a few that are for clients, mostly they're for, you know, I give them away content for free. The blog post, that's going to be available for free. Um, my next book, that'll be available, you know, for twelve ninety five or whatever. But I'm not, I'm not giving it away for giving it away's sake. Yeah, you're proving. Yeah, exactly. But also, I've got to, I've got to give it away. I've got to give enough away that people say, oh, actually, yeah, you should work with John. You should join this coaching club. You should, um, you know, work with him. You should not just buy this book and the next book. I'm, I'm not, I'm not here to sell books. I'm here to collect lifelong raving fan readers who will buy my 27th book in about 45 years time. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's fascinating. And do you know what the, the, the thing is like, you've, you've, you've built that trust up, but I think you mentioned this in Evergreen Assets. There's a, there's a, is it a soliciting firm that um, they, they outline how you should build your business. Yep. And then it's like, if you're struggling, yeah. we can do it for you. And a lot of people yeah. will see the advice and won't act on it. Yeah. Again, uh, there is someone. So he, uh, this guy called Nick, he does marketing for solicitors. And in that space, what you would normally, the, the machine you would normally build to, um, to market to solicitors for marketing is lots and lots of code calling, networking. Let's get to every networking breakfast. Let's shake a load of sweaty palms. Let's <laughs> eat some co bacon rolls. Let's go in and pitch to this client. Let, let's let's work really really hard. Nick wrote a book, and in that book he's gone right. Okay, this is how to market a law firm. By the way, I used to be a lawyer, so I know your pain points. I know what you're going through. I know you don't really want to market your business. I know you just want to do the law stuff because. I've been there. This is what you need to do. You need to do X, Y, and Z. Then you need to do this, then you do that. This is how you do it. Fantastic. Now you're probably thinking, I have got time to do all that. I'm meant to be running a law firm. If that's the case, I can do all that for you. Give me a shout. And all he does now is he's got the book. Remember, he's already written the book, so he doesn't need to redo that. He then sells the book in the back of the book. There is, by the way, if you want some more tips and tricks, join my email list, another asset. People go on the email list, they get his weekly value-led emails. He doesn't sell in the weekly emails. Bottom of the email, PS, if you'd like to have a chat about how I can help you, book a call. He doesn't pitch to anyone. All they do, so they find him on Amazon, they buy the book, they enjoy the book, they get value from the book, they pop themselves on his mailing list, they get more value from him, more free education. They then convince themselves, this guy Nick is the guy for me, I think I'm going to book a call with him. The very first time that Nick hears from any of these prospects, they are sat there with their credit card in hand. <laughs> yeah. That's the power of a good, really good ecosystem. And that's basically like one a way of evergreen assets, isn't it? That is, the, yeah. it's this, it's the same thing. And now, it, that's a powerful example. And that sounds an awful lot like someone else that are that I'm talking to at the moment. Because if you read evergreen assets, yeah. it, it's one of those things. It, again, it's the Lego block analogy where you, sometimes you don't have uh, inf pre prior information to attach it to. Now, if anyone's watching this and they want to see it in action. Drop John a message, and all of a sudden, it, it, without like putting you into machine because it's personal messages, it's helpful. Yeah. But you can see how it, the process works because all of a sudden you you know the framework that you're in, and then you're on the email list. You're talking to John. You're thinking about the one percent club. Yeah, and it, it's it's brilliant. It really is. And that if that's not like a like a selling point for the book, I don't know what is. Yeah, it, it's a little bit dangerous because I've now kind of revealed how the sausage is made. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and as I said, if that machine breaks, if I suddenly start selling, you know, 100,000 copies sure. of this book a month, my machine's going to break because it won't cope with that yeah. volume. But ultimately, yeah, that was, as I was writing this book, I was just thinking, okay, I'm just going to share, because this is, this is the model of the way my business is built. It's the way I've designed them over the last probably decade around this ecosystem. So I thought, I'm just going to describe how I have built my business, how I've assembled the different parts of my business. Some of them readers will read and go, well, that doesn't apply to me. I don't need that. Um, which is great because we started this call about the infinite amount of opportunities that are available. There There are an infinite number of assets that you could add to your business. What do we mention about Nick just now? He's got a book. He's got an email list. You can book a sales call with him. That's his ecosystem. Very, very simple. Um, I know other people who have much more convoluted ones, but there is a huge benefit to keeping it simple. And all I wanted to do was just share this is what works for me this is what works for others and yeah there's a little bit of trepidation i think now as people start to come in i literally had one person today saying i'm at the page where it uh, we're talking you're talking about referrals mm -hmm. and it says if you if you tell friend 10 friends about this book uh, i will buy you coffee and cake i've sent it this morning to my email list of 118 people <sighs> where how many how many coffees do i get and i'm like I like that. Okay, but well, <laughs> well done for spotting the flaw in my <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, minimum one per person. Uh, yeah, it should have been the T's and C's. Plymouth only. Yeah. <laughs> I like. I like it, and I think the way that you approach it. Again, I never really considered the scalability of it, but that's that's a good problem to face at the time, yeah. isn't it? A thousand true fans have heard that, and I think, yeah. as you say, if, if one person or a thousand people buy your book every five years you're going to do all right aren't you yeah. i really like there's a there's a my key principle um for this book and many of the other books i've read uh, i'll finish on this point is that consistency i think your whole routine machine kind of attested to that and the the most famous people i can think of they show up on time yeah. every day would you agree Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've, I've used this line since writing Routine Machine. So Routine Machine came out in 2019. And ever since then, I wish I'd put this on the front cover. Consistency is a superpower. That That is my superpower. Um, I discovered that. And that's the reason I wrote Routine Machine was I was on a podcast promoting my first book. And uh, it was the one thing podcast. So the one thing, Gary Keller, Jay Papazan. I was on with um, uh, Jeff Woods, their chief CEO. And... I didn't realize at the time he was grilling me, really grilling me. And he said, oh, routine's really important to you. You're like the king of routine. Oh, yeah, that's great. Years later, I heard a podcast with Jay Papasan talking with, I believe it was Tim Ferriss. And he said, oh, yeah, Jeff's, um, Jeff's superpower is finding out what other people's superpower is. And I went, that's what, what he did with me. <laughs> <laughs> full circle <laughs> and it was just yeah he identified that the reason i've had all the success is because i'm really 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 consistent if you think about the permanent mechanical elements of the ecosystem that don't rely on me the evergreen assets ecosystem gives you consistency without the human element i i can go away tomorrow and my business will consistently deliver the results that I have built based on the machine that I put together. Boom. Just Boom. like that. <laughs> One question, and like, because it's my first, first like sit down discussion at this length. I like I like the podcasts that ask like um uh questions that are very thought provoking, but okay. it's gonna be simple. What does success mean to you? Okay, oh, now, see, I've got a ready-made answer for this, which is my ideal job description. Yes, I thought it might be. Tell us all. Book. So I, I'll give you a little bit of context. I was in an NLP workshop many, many years ago, and I was having some success with my business, but I felt that it wasn't quite where I wanted it to be. It was never, I didn't really know what I wanted it to be, but I just knew that maybe it's a million pound business. Maybe it's the whole thing of when I've got this, I'll be happy. And the guy who was leading it gave us an exercise. He said, right, I want you to 
sit down and imagine you know you're writing your job description i was like we haven't, we haven't got jobs we're business owners like, write down your ideal job description where you are what you're doing who you're with uh what sounds you're hearing just imagine it and i so i, I played along and this was during a break and as i was writing it down i kind of had that boom moment in my head and i kind of got this smile on my face and i looked up and i caught locked eyes with the presenter and he's like what's happened there because he saw that moment and he came over to me and was like what happened there then and i went well i was working through it and i had my job description and it's kind of right i'm gonna do this type of work and it was really convoluted and then i said i narrowed it down to something that sounds vague but i know exactly at any point what that means so i said i want to do what i want when i want how i want where i want if i want i said i know what all that means i said now the reason i was smiling is because as i'm going through that i realized i'm 98 percent of the way there and i thought that you know i i still had half the mountain to climb until i would be successful and now i realize that actually i've taken a few days away from my business i'm staying in a nice hotel around the corner uh, i've chosen to be here today um i've got the freedom to write down this bit of paper whatever i want i'm living this ideal life right now and there are days maybe or hours when i don't and i'm forced to do things i don't want to do and i'm maybe not happy doing things and i've got to drag my ass out of bed but in general i'm 98 percent there and it was just that big smile was like oh my god i've I, the top of the mountain was back there <laughs> it's that classic and you, you sometimes you get so caught is, is the forest from the trees but you're so in yeah that you can't look back and appreciate what what where you've come from like you can't yeah. see the top of the mountain as you say it was knowing what i wanted and that really narrowed it down for us. It sounds vague, what I want, where I want, how I want, when I want, if I want. But I know, having worked in the civil service, which was the complete opposite, I was told where to go, when to be there, what I was going to do when I was there. If I didn't want to go there, tough. You've got to go there. Yep. Complete opposite of that. So you could sum it up in one word, freedom. But I like that clarification there. And I think it's, again, I, lo I, I love the point. That I love the Game of Thrones reference. But one thing here is you were in a workshop when someone recommended that exercise to you. Now, it's yeah. very easy just to sit here, passively listen to this conversation and go, oh, that was a good idea. But the profound moment came when you thought, OK, let's actually, come on, let's play with this a bit then and sit yeah. down and then actually do the work or do the task or whatever you want to frame it as take a bit of responsibility be active do the things and you might find you actually get some personal insights and then and then you have like a successful career look i mean look yeah absolutely read the book and follow the instructions boom 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 <laughs> that was it for today's chat thanks john i really appreciate that and i really enjoyed it um is there anything you want to plug like you know, all that stuff, read uh, Evergreen Usually stuff, obviously, books are all on Amazon. Uh, probably the best place to go to, actually, is my website, which is uh, bigidea.co.uk. You can find uh, links to the books on there, links to the podcast. Uh, what else have we got? 1% Club, that is all on. And my weekly emails, which I promise uh, will not sell you anything um, on a weekly basis. Plus, there's a free cat if you sign up in the next day. day. Don't, you'll be, it'll be like the coffees again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, only John. one one cat collection from Plymouth only. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, thanks for that. Fantastic. Thank you, Stuart.